the second time in two years, I'm back on St. Helena, a remote island in the middle of the Atlantic that has always had a special place in my heart. I'm here to see how the island is faring 14 months after its airport, built with some 285 million pounds of taxpayers' money, finally open to commercial passenger flights. I arrived at this British overseas territory, home to four and a half thousand people, with an open mind to talk with saints, as the locals are known. I met those helping to run the island, those entrepreneurs investing in the island, and also the man and woman on the street. However, I soon became concerned by some of the things that I was hearing from those who have already invested their savings and from those who are willing to invest more money but who increasingly lack confidence in the island's rulers. I don't think the island has changed significantly during this period. I think, if anything, we are going backwards in that financially, economically, the island and the islanders are battling. We did not get our capital grant from DFID, and as a result, we are 10 million pounds plus minus short in the budget. And local as well as inward investors sunk a lot of money, a lot of life savings, a lot of money was brought back from the UK or taken out from under one's mattresses. And people developed heavily in that last year, committing life savings and dreams and schemes, knowing full well that this was not going to come to fruition. The councillors allowed this to continue to happen. And that is where we are feeling very, very aggrieved, is that they knew there was a problem. They didn't tell us, but they encouraged us to invest. And now that we've invested and the numbers are not developing as they should, or were predicted or were promised, we are not actually being compensated for it at all. We're basically being told, hang in there, sweetheart, it'll come right. Well, I'm surprised a few of us haven't hung ourselves. Never mind, just hang in there. Behind me is St. Helena's controversial airport that for more than a year looked as though it might become a 285 million pound white elephant. It was initially unusable because it was deemed unsafe for planes to land due to the strong, unpredictable local winds. But it finally opened for commercial passenger aircraft in October 2017. I met Lynn Thomas, a local businesswoman in Jamestown, the island's capital. I guess it would need to, you would need to have additional airlines coming into here. But when, I mean, I don't know all the technicalities of which airlines can come in, but that we know that there are difficulties and challenges with, with the way the airport is, the, the runway is aligned. Uh, it would just need to, I don't know how, but we just need more airlines coming in with more people so they have a greater throughput. I can't see that that would happen with one airplane, but the one airplane that has, you know, is currently operating, at least it's something. So we have something like about 46 international tour operators marketing the island. Now, one of the things we're learning is the time it takes for a tour operator to come to know a destination, to get it into their plans. You know, these people are not planning for next week, they're planning for probably the year after next. So there's a time delay between getting people on board and committed and understanding what a fantastic destination it is and how much it has to offer. Here at uh, Longwood House, where Napoleon spent the majority of his time on St. Helena when he was in uh, exile, and when I was a two-year-old, I fell into this goldfish pond uh, fully clothed when my parents were on their way to my f father's first colonial posting in Nyasland, now Malawi. Some things in, in this kind of economy, you have to subsidize to make it work. Because of the, the uniquenesses, uh, you can't get the economies of scale. Look at things like fuel. We pay a huge, as much money uh, to freight the fuel here as we have to pay for the actual fuel itself. Now, 
you know, wages is, is low here. So those are kind of things I think where government should be stepping in, uh, if, if you know what I mean. We went um, from the RMS that was heavily subsidized uh, to now uh, sea freight that is not subsidized. That has caused some real pain uh, in our community since February this year. Our inflation is running at 4.1%. Uh, percent, but yet we are expected to still balance a budget uh, at the end of the day with a shrinking uh, tax base. We know we're not getting the, the returns from the tourists yet. We accept that because you can't build a tourist destination overnight. Uh, but I think there is just some lack of understanding uh, in the British Parliament of how a small isolated territory belongs to Britain sitting all this way in, in the middle of the South Atlantic, how it actually got to function, you know? This is Jonathan, the world's oldest tortoise and possibly the world's oldest animal. A giant Seychelles tortoise, he is believed to be around 186 years old and lives at Plantation House, the governor's official residence. Your working population is only like 3,000. That's your human resource and tax base. So the question, I'll leave it as a question. Can four and a half, can a village, can a village in the UK uh, uh, with, say, less than 3,000 of, 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 of the working population deliver all the services of its national government? This is Jacob's Ladder, 699 steps that were cut into the steep cliff by the military to enable ammunition and other supplies to be taken up from the harbor at Jamestown, the island's capital. The steps were completed in 1829, and when I was just two, my late father, then an extremely fit young man, carried me from the very bottom to the very top. So, uh, yes, as we have promised, we have Lord Michael Ashcroft with us here in the studio at uh, St. FM. And, of course, we got St. FM's own Tammy Williams as well. So, first of all, to you, uh, Lord Ashcroft, so welcome to St. FM again. It's been two years ago since you've been here. It has indeed. My affection for St. Helena remains as strong as ever. And it's a fascinating holiday location for the more adventurous traveller. But it also has major problems centred on too few visitors, partly due to its remoteness, but partly resulting from flights that are widely seen as expensive, infrequent and unreliable. Official predictions that tourist numbers will increase from around 1,000 a year to nearly 30,000 in some 25 years could prove to be absurdly overambitious. Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, recently aired the possibility that a small number of senior overseas diplomatic posts could be filled by experienced businessmen or women. And just days before I landed on St. Helena, it was announced that the new governor of the island will be Dr. Philip Rushbrook, who takes up his role in May. I mean no disrespect to the newly appointed governor, but surely St. Helena presented the perfect opportunity to put a business leader rather than a career civil servant in the role. Yes, it would have been a controversial move, but I think it would have been a bold and wise move too. <laughs> 